uh, the talk about sort of the scientific evidence linking um, Becker's ideas uh, by way of terror management theory um, to this idea of uh, the problem of climate change both in contributing to the problems um, in this idea of how we respond to the problem with this style um, and then talk about some ways that we can use this connection to encourage pro-environmental behavior. Um, so real briefly, in case you weren't here last night, um, I'll just go through a brief introduction to terror management theory. Um, so this theory was established as a way of empirically testing some of um, Becker's ideas, which obviously are um, very abstract and large scale. Um, so it boiled down the, the ideas that Becker presents into a system for empirical testing. Um, and basically, uh, the simplification is that we have a desire for self-preservation similar to all animals. Um, but unlike other animals, we have this unique self-awareness that allows us to understand ourselves um, and in relation to time in a way that other animals aren't able to. Um, and with this comes an idea that we all know that at the end of this journey that we're on, um, we're all going to inevitably die. Um, and this causes a great deal of anxiety for us. Because um, if we're always concerned about at any moment we could die, um, it may inhibit us from living our lives. So uh, Becker and terror management theory says that we have to come up with ways of dealing with this anxiety. Um, and the way that we do that primarily is through participation in a culture, um, our cultural worldviews. And these are just uh, meanings about reality that we all um, come up with and share together. Um, by, by participating in this culture, um, we're able to feel valuable. Um, we can gain self-esteem. So we can get a sense that we're, we're worth something um, in this, this meaningful universe. Um, and so within these worldviews, um, I'll talk a little bit about this later, so I want to introduce this again. Um, this idea of a literal immortality belief in which we believe in an actual part of us is going to live on after we die in the form of an immortal soul. Um, that maybe we'll go to heaven or be reincarnated. Um, there's also then this idea of symbolic immortality. The idea that we will live on through our cultural works and the legacy that we live on or that we leave here on earth. Um, so again, I just want to present a few basic ideas. Um, first is this idea that uh, the concern with death can lead to behaviors that have contributed to the problem that we see with uh, climate change, um, and also then the reaction of denial. Um, and second, I want to show how these can overcome some of these, or the idea of thinking about death can overcome some of these negative impacts. Um, so first I'd like to talk about just nature in general and sort of the threat that nature can present to us as humans. Um, so most people can understand why death is threatening. Um, even if they themselves don't admit that they're afraid of death, they typically can understand why somebody else might be. Um, but the idea that nature is threatening, um, you know, we associate nature with beauty, with inspiration. Um, it's often a place that we go to get away from the world and enjoy ourselves. Um, so the idea that it's threatening may be a sort of foreign idea for us. Um, but we can think about um, the wilderness and the idea of being alone in the wilderness can be very scary. And we often associate the wilderness with danger or death. Um, and I was thinking about this, and um, if you think about our fairy tales or our folk stories that we hear as children, um, oftentimes the woods are associated with wolves, um, witches that eat children, um, ghosts, these dangerous things that we want to stay away from. Um, and so uh, Kasser and Sheldon did some work, and they empirically tested this idea that we associate nature with death. Um, and they found that people do indeed associate um, nature with ideas of death. Let's move forward to that slide. Um, and so out of this uh, association, um, we have this desire to distance ourselves from nature in a similar way to the way we distance ourselves from death. Um, so we want to remind ourselves that we are not subject to the death and decay that we see in nature. Um, I create lasting achievements, I make scientific discoveries, I'm not simply a physical body that's going to die and decay. Um, so we have this need to distance ourselves from nature. Um, and we also have a need to control it. So one of the ways that we can establish our dominance over nature um, is by cultivating it. And so Coule and Vandenberg tested this. Um, they first presented people with 
wilderness photos. Um, and they presented people also with photos of cultivated nature. And what they expected is that thinking about death would increase people's preference for this cultivated nature. Um, and indeed, they found that participants thinking about death liked the cultivated nature more and the wilderness less. Um, typically, if we're not thinking about death, the participants in the control condition liked the wilderness scene more. And you can think about how this need to control nature can contribute to some of the problems that have um, caused the global warming and climate change. So things like the use of pesticides, um, our need to build in um, areas of wilderness, uh, the idea of a manifest destiny that we need to go out and conquer the world. Um, or I was thinking about the people who climb Everest. They've established that they've conquered nature. Um, so, so some of those ideas. And then again, the way that that contributes to climate change through a, um, you know, building these big freeways and driving our SUVs on them. So some of those behaviors. Um, at the same time, we also know that thinking about death leads us to pursue goals associated with amassing wealth. So, um, you know, in our culture, which is a capitalist culture, uh, we uh, very much associate this idea of wealth with um, success and happiness in our lives. Um, so when you pit these, um, when you pit the goal of achieving wealth against um, the more environmentally friendly goals, uh, what happens? Um, so Kasser and Sheldon looked at this. They had a forest management game, and the way that this game worked is participants were asked to make a bid for how much um, forest they wanted to, um, to harvest, sorry, um, as a way of uh, they could outbid other companies. So if you place a higher bid, the benefits are that you're more likely to succeed at getting the um, bid to harvest the forest. You can achieve wealth that way. But the benefits of placing a lower bid are that the forest will last longer and more people will be able to um, consume resources and the resources will last longer. Uh, and what they found is that when participants were thinking about death, they wanted to harvest more of the forest. So those goals of wealth undermined more conservation goals. Um, so unfortunately, we can see from these couple studies uh, that you know, basically, when we're thinking about death, um, our goals that we have to pursue wealth, um, to control the environment, are in direct conflict with some of these goals that would encourage more pro-environmental behavior. Um, and I want to talk about one particular group that I know we have a talk about later. Um, so I want to present some empirical data that we have on this group of religious fundamentalists. Um, and they present a particular problem for conservationists. Um, I was watching a documentary about Paul Watson, who's the captain of the Sea Shepherd organization, um, and they're a marine conservation organization. And he was talking about how these, uh, this group of people represents a particular um, resistance to, this, um, to appeals for conservation. Um, and so why might this be? Uh, well, there are several things going on, and one has to do with worldview. Um, so thinking about death leads religious people to defend their religious beliefs more, more um, vigorously. And built into many Abrahamic religious traditions is this idea that humans are separate from the rest of nature. Um, and oftentimes we talk about two different ideas that go on. So there's the idea of stewardship, which is that man is put on this earth to take care of nature, um, take care of the animals. The other idea is dominion which is that the resources on this earth are here for man's disposal. I mean, you can see how these two things are different. Um, one problem with both of these is that they do distance man from nature. Um, they elevate him sort of above it. And there's some evidence that religious fundamentalism is negatively associated with environmentalism. Um, surprisingly, this connection is pretty small when you look at the literature. Um, and that doesn't seem to really map onto what we're seeing in reality. Uh, so one key component that could be missing um, is this idea of mortality salience, thinking about death. So oftentimes, appeals for conservation may directly threaten people's religious worldviews. Um, they may have a reaction against 
more scientific evidence. Um, and Bess and Cox found that, indeed, um, it's under conditions where they're thinking about death that people who are high in religious fundamentalism feel less connected to nature. So not just generally, um, but specifically when they're thinking about death. Um, so up until this point, we've been discussing environmental concerns in general. Um, so what about this problem of climate change? Um, so one thing that makes climate change different from other environmental concerns is that it represents an end of world scenario. So while we may be concerned about issues of deforestation, um, cons conservation of animal species, that may make us sort of sad or angry or concerned, um, it doesn't necessarily directly threaten our species. Uh, climate change represents a threat to the human race. Um, and if you can imagine, um, most of the behaviors we engage in on a regular basis, uh, the goal of those behaviors is to achieve some sense of our own immortality and that we're going to leave a lasting impression on this earth. Um, so if I write academic articles and my goal is then for people to read those and think that they're interesting after I die, um, if there's nobody left on this earth to read those articles, that's very threatening to me. Um, so th this is the reason primarily why this issue is different than just other environmental issues. Um, additionally, it can represent a threat to an important aspect of our worldview. Um, and this is an article that Janice turned me on to. Um, it's by Feinberg and Willer. Um, and they investigate this idea that incorporated into our worldview are just world beliefs. Um, and people who are high in just world beliefs um, feel that the world is a place where good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. Um, so they looked at two different arguments for global warming. Um, they looked at a more dire apocalyptic message that global warming is going to signify the end of the world. Um, and then they looked at a positive global warming message. And I know that sounds sort of like an oxymoron, um, but what they did is they framed it in ways that we can overcome global warming. So more about the action that we can take. Um, and what they found is that people who are high in just world beliefs, which again represents an important component of our worldview in general, um, they saw that they reacted with more skepticism in response to the apocalyptic article. Um, so uh, the idea with the more skepticism, that directly represents this um, rejection of and denial of climate change. Um, what I think is really important is that those positively framed messages about what we can do, they reacted with less skepticism than people you know, who have the lower just world beliefs. So not only are, is it sort of negating the impact, it's actually improving their feelings about global warming. They are more interested in doing things about that. Okay, and again, another component of worldview that influences this um, is soul belief. And so if we think about um, what we discussed earlier, uh, people high in religious fundamentalism, when they're thinking about death, feel less connected to nature. Um, you might think then that global warming represents a greater threat to them. Um, but we have to consider this piece that with soul belief, I have a literal immortality belief that my soul is going to live on in this other world after I die. Um, so why might that better protect you from an end of world scenario? Uh, if my soul is going to live on in another world, um, then I'm not that concerned about what happens here on this world. Um, and so my lab mate, Dave Weiss, uh, tested this idea, and he found that indeed people who believe in an immortal soul are less threatened by end of world scenarios generally. Um, and when he looked specifically at global warming behavior, um, he found something that was really interesting, I think. Um, what he found is that if you look at agreement in the global warming article, um, people who have soul belief actually agree with the article. So they think that this is a problem. What we find with the second graph shows is that they're less threatened by it. So it's basically, okay, yeah, that's a problem. I don't really care. So um, I think that that's a very different thing than just rejecting the message altogether. Um, and this graph can be a little confusing. Uh, it shows reaction time to death-related words, um, which, so if the bar is lower, that indicates a faster reaction time. A faster reaction time indicates that death is more sort of close to conscious awareness. 
And that's related to then um, the threat of the message. So hopefully that's more clear. Um, but essentially what this means is that we may need to target um, people with soul belief in just a little bit different ways. If they believe in the article, but they're just not concerned, um, what we may need to do is play into more of their symbolic immortality strivings. Um, so most people, even if they place a lot of emphasis on literal belief, do have some connections on this earth. They have children, um, they, have, uh, they participate in culture, so they, I imagine, do want this earth to continue in the way it is at some level. Um, and so incorporating that into arguments that target this group of people um, may be sort of the way to go when you try and convince them of the importance of um, pro-environmental behaviors. Okay, and so at this point, um, you may all be feeling like the world is in sort of a dire state. Um, you know, all of these negative things come from thinking about our own death. Um, but how can we use these to encourage people to engage in pro-environmental behaviors? Um, so we talked about worldview. Um, so what if incorporated into your worldview is an idea that being a good environmentalist is important and a source of self-esteem. So what the theory would say is that if that's important to my worldview, I'm going to then, following thinking about death, I'm going to engage in more pro-environmental behavior. Um, and what Vess and Arndt found is that for participants with high versus low contingencies of self-esteem, um, they found these similar effects. So, if you're high in environmental contingencies, excuse me, of self-esteem, then your self-esteem is very tied up in this idea of being a good environmentalist. So this is one of the items that they used. Uh, and here are their results. And we can see that for people low in environmentally contingent self-worth, um, we see effects similar to what we were seeing previously, that thinking about death um, decreases environmental concern. But, as expected, when we look at the people for whom um, environmentally contingent self-worth is high, we actually see an increase in pro-environmental behavior after thinking about death. Um, so you may be wondering, how can we use this then for the people who are low in environmentally contingent self-worth? Um, so, uh, Fritch and colleagues have been doing some work uh, with priming norms, and they found that you can move people um, to look like these environmentally contingent self-worth people. Um, so what they did, and um, I really enjoy this methodology because it shows a couple different things. Um, so they're using just a general environmental <coughs> prime. So it doesn't necessarily need to be related to the specific behavior that you're targeting. Um, they also showed that it's, it can be very subtle. So what they did is they had people come into the lab, and as part of the experiment, the experimenter either apologized for the messy lab and cleaned up that space, um, or they just sort of kick the trash around. In the pro-environmental condition, um, so, oh, and then they looked at their interest in this vehicle, either a Ford Exhibition, which is, or Expedition, which is a big SUV, um, and then, uh, or a hybrid vehicle, a Toyota Prius. And so what they found is that when you prime people with these pro-environmental norms, um, they're more interested in the Toyota Prius. So they start looking more like these people who have environmentally contingent self-worth. Um, additionally, in a second study, they primed norms of self-interest versus common interest. And then they looked again at that forest management game where people make bids to harvest uh, portions of the forest. And what they found is that um, when self-interest was primed, we see the same results that Catherine Sheldon found, um, that thinking about death makes you want to harvest more forest. Um, but when you prime people with a common interest norm, we, actually, we don't just see them going back down to control levels. We actually see that they're harvesting less forest. Um, so that's also encouraging. OK, and then um, you know, that talks more specifically about sort of targeting the person, making norms salient. Um, there's also different things that you can do with the message to help to influence these people for whom environmentally uh, contingent self-worth is low. So Fritch and Hafner um, looked at biocentric motivation for conservation versus anthropocentric motivation. Um, and a biocentric motivation is a concern and respect for nature. Um, so 
It's uh, I wish for the kind of pro-environmental action that brings human back to, humans back to harmony with nature. Um, so this is very much about nature. Um, the anthropocentric motivation, on the other hand, is a very selfish and egoist motivation, and it's more about what can nature do for me. And so this one uh, would be like protection of the environment is about preserving our future as humankind. So what they found is that, so for people who are high um, in environmental identity, the type of message doesn't matter. Um, but when you're looking at these people for whom their environmental identity is low, it's not as important to them, uh, the type of message does really make a difference. So thinking about death decreases their biocentric pro-environmental motivation, but not their anthropocentric motivation. So this also has implications in that we probably need to be framing these messages in ways in which we're talking about um, what helping the environment can do for people um, in order to encourage change in that group. Um, and so just sort of to recap, um, we found that thinking about death contributes to the problem of climate change in that it causes us to need to control nature. Um, it also leads to consumptive behavior that's in direct opposition to our pro-environmental goals. Um, and so thinking about how we can overcome these, um, when we think about contingent self-worth, um, this is a process that occurs very early on in our lives. We form the basis for our self-worth at an early age, um, and we can think about how in education, um, being good is associated with doing certain behaviors. Um, so if we can socialize children to equate being a good person with being a good environmentalist, then we may be able to encourage some change in that way. Um, additionally, we can incorporate pro-environmental norms into people's worldviews. Uh, and I actually noticed while I'm out on this campus um, that there is a lot of signs about recycling, um, about composting. All of those things, um, you know, from the evidence we see, are not only going to encourage those kinds of behaviors, but they may generalize to other pro-environmental behaviors, um, just simply because we have those reminders in our environment. Um, and additionally, we can, again, frame appeals from an anthropocentric perspective. Um, so talk about how helping the environment is going to help us. Uh, and that way, um, we can encourage uh, not only the people who already feel strongly about the environment, but the people who, for maybe, it's not as important to them. Um, so uh, I thank you guys all for being here. Um, we're going to have some question and answer. I know I moved quickly through that. So if you guys have questions or want me to go back to certain slides, I'm very happy to do that. Um, and then, yeah. So.